Good evening, and thank you for attending. My name is Natalie Sayre, and I will be the moderator for this evening's candidate debate. The Citizens Clean Election Commission is the sponsor for this evening's event. The Clean Elections Act is a campaign finance reform measure initiated by Arizona citizens and passed by voters in 1998. Participation as a clean elections candidate is strictly voluntary. The system provides full funding for qualified candidates who agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and rules. To qualify for funding, participating Paying candidates must illustrate the support of their constituents by gathering $5 qualifying contributions from registered voters in their legislative district. The candidates agree to adhere to contribution and spending limits and may not accept money from special interest groups. They also agree to participate in these debates. As we move into the debate, we encourage audience questions. If you have questions, please print them clearly on the card given to you when you walked in and hold it up. One of our volunteers will pick up the cards and deliver them to me. We screen questions for clarity, to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. If you need another card, just raise your hand. The debate is scheduled for one hour. We, so we may not get to all of the audience questions, but we will do our best. There's an independent timer who will see that all of the candidates <coughs> have equal time to answer each question, and we'll tell them when their time is up. Our format this evening, opening statements, two minutes. A quick lightning round, two minutes to answer general questions, two minutes to answer candidate to candidate questions, and closing statements, two minutes. We ask that you remain polite to all of the candidates and give them a fair un and uninterrupted hearing, no matter how strongly you may agree or disagree with anything being said. This means no applause, outbursts, or cheers, except in a moment when we introduce the candidates. This is especially important as closed captioning services will be made available after this debate. As such, I will refer to each candidate by their full name prior to each question and ask that candidates speak clearly into the microphone. Allow me to introduce Ms. Andrea D'Alessandro, candidate state senator, district number two, Democrat, participating in clean elections. Mr. Daniel Estrella, Candidate, State Senator, District 2, Republican. Mr. John Ackerley, Candidate, State Representative, District 2, Republican. Mr. Damian Klinko, Candidate, State Representative, District 2, Democrat. And Ms. Rosanna Galvadon, Candidate, State Representative, District 2, Democrat. The order in which the candidates will speak has been determined by alphabetical order, by last name starting with the Senate, and will progress from that starting point. The closing order will be determined by reverse alphabetical order by last name. Ms. Andrea D'Alessandro, will you start your opening remarks, please? Sure. Thank you very much. I'm Senator Andrea D'Alessandro, and first of all, I'd like to ch uh, thank the Citizens Clean Elections Commission for <coughs> changing the venue. It had been pre previously scheduled in LD10, and I called and they changed it, so I'm glad that it is more convenient for you. Um, I was born in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty, and I was the granddaughter of immigrants, and because of opportunity, mainly through affordable higher education, I was able to live my American dream. My goal is to, for every child, every family, every small business in, in Legislative District 2 in the state of, of Arizona to live their American dream. I bring my experience as an educator. I was a math teacher and college professor. My 25 years serving as a certified public accountant. 
I'm a mother, a grandmother, and a wife of a disabled uh, Vietnam veteran who served two terms with the Marines. When I ran original, originally, I ran on four issues, support of public education, job creation and economic development, veterans issues, and clean air and water. But in my time in the House first, I was elected to the House in 2012, I found, people found me to be an able committee member in both government and reform and human services. I de dealt with a lot of child protective services issues. When I was unanimously appointed to the Senate in, in January of this year, I was chosen to sit on judiciary, public safety, and natural resources. And I get very positive feedback as an intelligent, caring, listening senator, and I uh, greatly enjoy being the senator for Legislative District 2. Thank you. Mr. Daniel Estrella. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Daniel Estrella, and I am running as the Republican for, for the state Senate here in LD2. And the reason why I'm running this is for representation. Right now, uh, we don't have um, the effective representation that we need here in southern Arizona in order for us to go ahead and assert our influence in Maricopa County, where the capital is. Now, what happens is, is that we have elected officials that are well-meaning, but they are not of the majority party. So what happens is, is that we need to go ahead and have people that can represent us in order to go ahead and go forth and pass legislation that will be effective and be able to spur economic growth, remove regulations, and be able to allow us here in Arizona to prosper and flourish. Now, that is the reason why I am running for office. Now, a little bit about my background is that I am a United States Marine. I was a Marine for 13 years, and I served honorably. And then I decided to go ahead and return home to the state of Arizona where I was raised. And then after that, I joined the National Guard where I became the part of the funeral and honors detail. I did that until I was called up for the Southwest border mission where I was um, lived out there in Nogales for 18 months in order to go ahead and stem the tide of illegal immigrants that were coming through and also to go ahead and stop the human trafficking and the drug trade coming through into our communities. So we did that effectively, and then I was also, as a part of the aviation element of this, uh, for, until June of this year. Now I'm, um, thank you. And now I'm here to go ahead and be your representative in order to make sure that we can all pursue our American dream and also prosper in it and for prosperity for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. John Ackerley. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of you um, for coming out tonight. Um, I want to thank those people who are watching at home. Um, thank you for taking the time to participate in a very important process. We have a lot of decisions to make for Arizona as we move forward. My name is uh, John Christopher Ackerley. Um, my parents gave me a curse. They got, called me by my middle name. So I never know, you know who's going to know me by John and who's going to know me by Chris. But I, I go by Chris. So. Um, uh, <clears throat> Um, I am a high school physics teacher. Um, um, my wife is a teacher as well. Um, my wife and I live in Sarita. Um, I am a third generation Arizonan. Um, my family has uh, pretty deep roots here in, in the community. Um, as a teacher, part of what has prompted me to get into politics is education policy. That is where my experience is, that's where my expertise is, that's where my passion is. Um, and unfortunately, in the state of Arizona, we have not done such a good job, not only with funding, um, there's always a, a debate about funding, but we haven't done such a good job with education policy. Um, and I want to see if I can help um, solve some of that. Um, I'm also running because I'm deeply concerned about um, representation for um, southern Arizona. Um, we have a situation where we squabble a bit um, with uh, Maricopa, the great state of and I would like to see if we can't sort of build some better relationships um, to try to move some things in southern Arizona. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, again, thank you guys for coming out, um, and I would greatly appreciate your consideration for a vote in November. Thank you. Mr. Damien Klinko. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody in attendance and to the Clean Elections for facilitating this. I was appointed to the um, State House of Representatives in February by a bipartisan group of the Pima County Board of Supervisors um, after um, Linda Lopez resigned. Um, I, I stepped forward and got involved in this um, 
because I have become exhausted by watching my friends and my colleagues and my cohorts leave our community because we don't have a diversified, high-paying job um, platform. Um, new education is integral to this. Uh, we have underfunded our education system so significantly that companies are not coming. And the young people who are growing up and who strive to be entrepreneurs and to be leaders and to be um, business owners are, are leaving our region and starting companies in California and Texas and Colorado. Um, and they're, and they're, as they're having kids, they're very worried about the, our education system. So this is really the reason, the primary reasons I got involved um, in, in this. Um, and it has been a tremendous pleasure and, and real honor to serve each and every one of you in the State House. Um, I was appointed to financial institutions and the government committee. And I have worked very, very hard to represent the people of, um, of the legislative district too. Um, I've taken all of the input that um, everyone has given in making my decisions and really tried to be reasoned and fair and really always looking for what is good for Southern Arizona and what is good for the great state of Arizona and what is good for, for our neighbors and our friends. Um, so that's, that's really, really why I got into this. My background, um, I grew up in Tucson, born and raised, and I, I moved away and I moved back um, and I got involved in economic development, and I've worked in um, leveraging cultural resources in disinvested areas um, to really improve the quality of life of our community and really um, spur, spur our economy. So those are the things I've been involved with. I, I really look forward to this debate and really look forward to, uh, to working um, with all of you in the future. Thank you. Ms. Rosana Galvadon. Good evening. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you everyone for coming out, and I thank the Clean Elections for sponsoring this. Um, I am Rosana Gavaldon, and I'm your Arizona State Representative. Uh, you know, I have legislative priorities, and some of them include water sustainability, uh, early childhood development and public education, and economic development. You know, I just, you know, join me, and let's build a better future for Arizona. As, as your State Representative, I bring leadership, experience, and common sense to the political, social um, and, and economic future of Arizona. Um, you know, um, we need, it's gonna take cooperative leadership to stand up and make things happen in our state. And because that's what Arizona needs. It needs a little common sense and straight from the heart. You know, our best days are ahead of us, but it's gonna take us to come together and work together so that we can make that happen. Your support and encouragement is important to me. I came to Southern Arizona in 1973. I love living here. I love being a public um, official. I love being a public servant. And I've been, since, for many, many years, I've given back to my community through boards and commissions. So I look forward to your questions, and thank you. Thank you. In an attempt to lighten the mood for tonight's debate, we're going to do a quick lightning round of this or that. This will allow us to get, the can get to know the candidate to get to know more about the candidates. Please answer with just one word. Mr. Daniel Estrella, Droid, iPhone or Windows? Droid. Mr. John Ackerley, CNN, Fox News or MSNBC? C-SPAN, <laughs> was on the list. Mr. Damien Klinko, Facebook or Twitter? Facebook. Ms. Rosana Galvadon, Mac or PC? PC. And Ms. Andrea D'Alessandro, Lumberjack, Sun Devil, or Wildcat? A Wildcat. <laughs> <laughs> now you. on to this evening's questions. The first one will go to Mr. John Ackerley. You, we'll start with you. Please identify what you consider to be the most pressing issue in your district and how will you address it if elected? Well, like I said, um, I, what's given me uh, passion to get into politics is education policy. Um, and I think that is actually the biggest issue that is facing our state. It is by far the largest portion of what the state spends and local um, jurisdictions spend their money on. It is the biggest part of government and it is the, the thing that we have to fundamentally get right. Um, what I bring to the table um, is experience in that field. So many of our legislators, all of them in fact, will say they support public education. But there's a difference between supporting and advocating for it. 
And one, like I said, one of the things is, is I bring the experience. I have 15 years in the classroom. I have taught at all levels. I have been engaged in uh, policy level discussions for the past 10 years. Um, I bring the expertise, the experience to the table um, to help not only um, try to move the policies in the right direction, but also develop communication between legislators and the education profession. So often, we're speaking across each other, and we're not um, doing right by our kids, by our students, um, by doing that. We're, we're basing decisions on politics and not what's really most effective and what's most beneficial um, to the kids in the classroom. And I have the ability um, to bridge those two worlds, um, to bring some common sense um, needed reform uh, to our education policy. Thank you. Mr. Damien Klinko, your response, please. Well, I would absolutely agree with Mr. Ackerley. Um, education is a priority in this district and in this state, um, but his colleagues have underfunded education. It's plain and simple. We are 49th in pure per pupil spending in this country, in this state. Mississippi, I believe, is the only state that, um, that is below us. We're spending more now out of our general fund on our prisons than we are on our universities. I don't think that that's common sense, good priorities. We need to be focusing on making sure that our teachers stay in the classroom and that we don't have a massive turnover rate that destabilizes education. We need to make sure that we're investing in the educational system in a way that is meaningful and can actually transform and increase and improve the, the quality of our students. You know, I talk to companies across this country now and they say that they are thinking about Arizona, but when we're getting a D, from the uh, from the national um, from national organizations on our education ranking, it was in the paper today. I mean we're, that we are in the wrong place if we are going to going to attract corporations and companies and really grow our economy. Our education and our economy are tightly intertwined, um, and we need to be focused on making sure that we make good proper investments into into education. Um, in addition to that. Um, our, our district is, is really unique in the fact that it is, um, it is, it is disproportionately affected by immigration uh, policy in this country. And we have watched the, uh, the creep of economic disinvestment um, uh, along our border, um, hitting places like Tubac from Nogales. And we need to, as a state, really begin to reprioritize rural Arizona and making sure that all of Arizona um, comes out of this recession and not just Phoenix. Uh, we really need to be focused on strong economic policies that help uh, help shape the future and really empower our, our all of Arizona. Thank you. Ms. Rosanna Galvedon. Thank you. I just came from a conference in Dallas, Texas, where ele elected officials from across the country talked about infrastructure. And you, and what happened was is there's a, there's a, um, an, a, a U.S. Um, group of engineers, and they graded all these different types of infrastructure. For example, our drinking water, they rated it D. Okay. So infrastructure is very important for the state of Arizona, not only for, for our future, but it, we need to start investing more in what we, in what we call our infrastructure. Um, one of the things that I mentioned was water sustainability. You know, where are we going to get the next bucket of water? You know, other thing is other things are are, are roads. Um, when we when we talk about trade and commerce coming from from um, Mexico, what do we talk? We're talking about a new port of entry, but yet there's a bottleneck called State Route 189, Mariposa Road. The state of Arizona needs to invest and and and, and build upon that road so that 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 trade and commerce can bring in that revenue to the state of Arizona. So infrastructure is very important, not only our roads, but our rail, our transportation, and Arizona needs to get on the ball and really start looking at our aging infrastructure and addressing it. Thank you. Ms. Andrea D'Alessandro? Well, I agree also that support of public education is our number one issue. In this district, 34% of the children live in poverty, and that is unacceptable. But it's education linked with economic development and job growth. Without the support of education, uh, we will not have the job growth. When a, a, an executive looks at Southern Arizona, 
he or she is going to say, where am I going to send my children to school, number one? Number two, where am I going to get a qualified workforce? I believe that we need to restore the cuts to public education, and we should also uh, be pressuring us, and not only us, but all the legislators to uh, to go forward with the court ruling that says the uh, voter mandated inflation adjustment that the voters of Arizona supported needs to be uh, in reinstated, not to have more frivolous lawsuits. They are appealing it. It's a waste of money. It's only making the lawyers rich, and it should be going directly into the classroom. Other aspects of uh, of education or higher education. Our Arizona Constitution says that higher education should be as near to free as possible. And we've seen the escalating costs of higher education because of the GOP-led legislature doesn't believe that much in public education, unfortunately, and they're violating the Constitution. Additionally, I have been working closely with the community colleges, and uh, Pima Community College is getting the short end of the stick, and they, they have a, a wide variety of missions, not only preparing people for your college, but vocational, and they are an economic driver, and they're not getting their fair share, and, I, and I'm, I'm fighting for that. Uh, Thank you. And Mr. Daniel Estrella. First and foremost, it's about the economy. I mean, right now in Southern Arizona, the lines have drawn, have uh, the redistricting changed all the lines, but it didn't change the problems. We still are having economic problems here just because of the fact that we've, we've done redistricting and we've changed the legislation, legislators down here a little bit. It doesn't change the problems. We need to go ahead and be pro-Arizona and not a boycott Arizona situation. We need to go ahead and say, whenever I see uh, a company moving from California, from Illinois. I wonder why didn't it come to Arizona? It's because of the fact that it's so hard for us to go ahead and open up a business here. There's so many regulations down here in Southern Arizona. There's so many layers of red tape. So people don't want to come down here, first and foremost. So then even if we have the best education system out here, if we're not pro-business and if we're not going ahead and allowing those people to come down here and utilize the people that we already have, when we already have 20% in Nogales unemployment, those people want to go to work. But there's no work if there's no businesses. You know, there's any programs you can, you can go ahead and put out there, there's still the jobs need to come down here. We need to be attracting these places. We need to be a business magnet. And how we do that is allow people to go ahead and open up plants. Southern, um, Southern Arizona and Santa Cruz County in particular has the most industrialized zoning of any other of the counties. So we need to utilize these things. We need to utilize our infrastructure in order to improve it. Because all these things cost money and they're taxpayer dollars. But there's not taxpayer dollars if there's not a business providing jobs to those people. So that's first and foremost what we need to do first. Because we're trying to get the cart before the horse. We need to go ahead and have the economic drivers push forward in order to go ahead and raise all the boats. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Mr. Damien Klinko. What is your position on Common Core? So Common Core is, uh, is, the standards are important. In order to compete in a national and international c climate, we need to have standards. Now, how those standards are fully flushed out, how we develop them into something that works for Arizona, you know, that's going to be a, a community process where everyone is going to participate, parents, and teachers, administrators, um, and the legislature. Uh, but having standards is really important to today's workforce. I mean, we hear it all the time. I mean, we are competing now not just with the small town next door. We're competing with cities in India and China and in Europe. And we need to have students who are ready and are ready to compete. Thank you. Ms. Rodana Galvadon, your response, please. Common Core is it's an internationally benchmark. You know, our, our standards should be similar to, to the world which, which our children, our students, are going to be competing uh, towards. Uh, you know, Common Core is going to cover multiple skills, you know, for the questions. So therefore, it's going to kind of uh, um, improve their critical uh, learn, uh, thinking and problem solving. 
that's what we need is we need we need our future empl employment our future employees to think outside the box so that because we, we have so, so many innovators we have so many home based businesses we have so many uh, these these young people that bring such excellent ideas and common core is going to teach our students in our in our schools our public schools how to think critically and so and the, and common core is their standards there's that expectation there's that to and and again our children are going to be able to go into the workforce and we're going to be able to home grow our workforce because our children are going to learn some some common standards thank you Ms. andrea d'alessandro as a teacher for over 25 years, everything from seventh grade math to seniors in college, I've learned about Bloom's taxonomy. It's different levels of learning. Our old system of AIMS was a, a mile wide and an inch thick. It is on the lower level of, of Bloom's taxonomy where you memorize things, you identify things. But to get our students of tomorrow to fill the jobs that we want to come to Arizona, they need to have higher level skills like critical thinking and analysis and that is the main basis of why I support Common Core. Uh, the uh, what I'm against in the process is our uh, drive for so much standardized testing. No standardized test ever let a child or a young person learn anything. It doesn't, it makes, big businesses make lots of money on it, but it doesn't help the learning process. Uh, so I do, I do support Common Core, and so does the business community. Um, and uh, last year in the Senate, a bipartisan group of us stood up and we, we, we went forward with Common Core. The, chamber, the big Chamber of Commerce in Arizona is for it, and lots of other groups. Um, it, it does have some uh, federal funding attached to it, but it came from the go governors around the, sta the state. And it's not that what's gonna happen in the classroom is not going to be the same thing in every district. They set the standards, they're good standards, and how a local school board implements it is up to them. They know best what will work in their community. Thank you. Mr. Daniel Estrella. My feeling is that our children, we are, we're doing a disservice to them because of the fact that school is for the children. It's not for all the other money and, and to be made off of that. And it seems like the, it's become the business of education as opposed to the business of teaching students. That's the biggest problem that we have right now. So once we go ahead and change that dynamic and stop looking at our children as numbers on a board and individually trying to teach them reading, writing, and arithmetic, then go ahead and make sure that they're prepared for life outside of just education. Because all that was hammered to me all my entire life was that you needed education to be successful. You needed to do all these things. And a lot of people are saddled with a lot of debt now because of this, because of those promises that they were made. So the problem still is, is that you need to go ahead and be able to have the jobs ready for them. If there's, they can be as educated as you want, but if you're still you know, at a call center or some of these other jobs that we call successes here, then you're not you're not doing a, a you're doing a disservice to the children. So the Common Core is is there and it's a standard that we have right now. But the problem is, is that we need to go ahead and make sure that we're monitoring it and that we're making sure that people aren't taking advantage of the situation with the big government. The reason why big businesses is behind this is there's a lot of money there to be made by textbooks, by standardized testing, by things that are consultants. All those things are there. And they're, everyone's going to go ahead and dip into this big pot of money, and then they're going to go run away. And we're still not educating the children properly. Here in Arizona, half of our budget is on education. Where is that money going? Because it's not going into the classrooms. 42 cents, 42% uh, of that is, is being spent elsewhere in administrative roles. So let's go ahead and put that money back in the classrooms and fund the classrooms in order to go ahead and get our students back in the game. Because we're not, we're not trying to be a third world country, so let's not compete like one. Thank you. Mr. John Ackerley, your response. I really only get two minutes for this? Yeah, we're good. Two uh, minutes, sir. <clears throat> All right. Let's see if we can put this into two minutes. Uh, as an educator, I am really, really, really frustrated with the conversation about Common Core. Um, the, with all due respect to my opponents, they get to talk about it um, from the 30,000 foot level. They don't get to see the reality of it. Um, and I am tired of 
when an educator especially, but when anybody raises objections to the implementation of Common Core, the immediate response is, is well, we've got to have good standards. I'm all for good standards. I use some of the most rigorous sets of standards in my classes that I can. That's not the question. The problem is all about the implementation, and unfortunately with Common Core, you can't just buy the standards. It comes with the whole package. And so my, my I, objection to the implementation plan for Common Core is Arizona is first off, tying our, um, all of our decisions to a nationalized standard test abdicates way too much control from our local level. The second thing is, is it reinforces a lot of bad policy that has been built upon high stakes testing over the last 20 years, and it makes it almost incapable of getting rid of that bad policy because we've cemented it in with Common Core. The third thing is, is decisions are being made on political basis, not what's in the best interest of the student. They're being made based upon political legacies and capital. And the fourth reason is, the cost. Any educator will tell you that they don't need the standardized test to tell you how the kids in their class are doing. The reason that we need a standardized test is to monitor the health of the system. And in order to do that, we don't have to test every kid every year. Thank you. The next question, we'll start with Ms. Rosanna Galvadon. What would you do to spur economic development in Arizona and the border region? Thank you. Economic development is, is the foundation for our state. That's, we really rely on economic development, it, it, starting with our education, um, home growing our, our um, workforce. Uh, you know, in regards to, to ha uh, trade and commerce with, with uh, our neighbors to the south, Mexico, it's so important that we embrace them. They, they are going to be bringing a lot of good things for us and we for them. It, the, I mean, there's some good things that are happening. I, I, point, I spoke a little bit about the, the port of entry in, uh, in Nogales. I mean, the, fed, the feds have spent millions of dollars so that we can have those, those, tru those trucks and, and, and rail come across easily. That's going to bring revenue into the state. You know, um, again, I'm going to reference the conference that, came to, that I went to. California and Texas are very aggressive. Texas needs, I mean, Arizona needs to be there because if we are not at the table, we're on the menu. When it comes to economic development, we can spur it by, again, with our infrastructure, by investing in our, our, um, our education, if it be our, our K through 12, our colleges, our universities, our JTEDs, any kind of training so that we can bring um, a, a better workforce so that we can have more businesses come into the state of Arizona. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Andrea D'Alessandro. Again, it, it is tied in with support of public edu education. Uh, I was recently named a champion of tourism because I feel that legislative district two is God's country and uh, people should come down and visit. We have uh, clean wa water, clean air at night. You know, this district represents uh, part of Pima and all of Santa Cruz County at night in some areas, we can feel like we can reach up and, and uh, touch the stars. And I'm trying to uh, stop people from bad mouthing our area. And that's one of the, re you know, I say this is a safe, culturally diverse, beautiful place. You know, people often ask, is your district urban, suburban, and rural? And I just say yes, because we have cities like Nogales and Tucson, uh, but, but we have residential, uh, uh, communities, uh, uh, suburban, like where I live in Sawadita, but we, all, we also have ranches on the border and other places. I think that we need to take care of two resources that we have in this area. One is the University of Arizona. It is an economic driver, and some at the legislature are hell-bent at underf underfunding it. It's the place of innovation and we, we need to support that. Also, I support Chancellor Lee Lambert at Pima Community College because he's working 
to uh, talk to businesses and find out exactly what they ne their needs are. But last but not least is certainly our support of Davis Montham and represent my seatmates, Representative Demian Klinko and Rosanna Gabaldon and I are very uh, uh, involved with uh, maintaining uh, the presence of uh, Davis Montham Air Force Base because along with the University of Arizona and Raytheon, those are our three uh, pivotal areas. Thank you. Mr. Daniel Estrella. Can you repeat the question, please? Certainly. Yeah, okay. What is your, what would you do to spur economic development in Arizona and the Borderland region? Well, I touched on that already. Um, well, first of all, it's about to be, um, to allow Southern Arizona to be pro-business to go ahead and show that we're going to go ahead and attract these places. We have um, some of the best roads right now, and also we have the port of entry that's state-of-the-art. Uh, we can go ahead and push so much produce trade back and forth through Mexico um, all the way that puts down $18 billion a year into our economy back and forth in the state of Arizona. So now what, what happens is that we need to go ahead and have the Border Patrol and the CBP and, and the ICE agents to go ahead and fully staff that. And that's how we go ahead and put pressure on the federal government to make sure that that, that goods and those goods go ahead and flow through there um, in a fashion because of the fact that produce that goes back and forth there is where we get most of our food now. It used to be the state of California used to feed us, but they've been in a drought for a very long time. So now Mexico is the thing that goes ahead and feeds Arizona and the southern and western region. So now we got to go ahead and make sure that we're, we're doing our best to facilitate for that. And also in that is also be confident in trying to push for the I-11 corridor and going ahead and making that, that become a reality in order to go ahead and take some of the pressure off of the I-19 to make it safer for the residents that live there and push it all the way down to Las Vegas. Those are the things that are gonna go ahead and spur growth through the infrastructure and, 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 and spur trade going up the eight, the 40 and the 10 all the way there to Las Vegas and make it a little safer for us all here. Thank you, Mr. John Ackerley. No offense to whoever submitted the question, but I'm always frustrated by this question. Yes, we need infrastructure investment. Yes, we need to protect the assets we have in Southern Arizona. Yes, we need to facilitate international trade because for our region, that's the, the promising area <coughs> is logistics operations along the, um, uh, along the corridor there. But I'm gonna be one voice out of 60 um, in, um, in the legislature. I I'm not gonna spur economic development. What I'm gonna be able to do is I'm going to be able to be a link, a communications link, uh, an advocate for the communities, the businesses communities, the um, governmental communities in the different jurisdictions, the educational communities, the environmental communities, whatever they happen to be, uh, I'm going to be, be able to be <coughs> an advocate uh, and a communications conduit from them to the state legislature to advocate to get things done. Just in and of myself, I'm not going to be able to do that. And so the challenge is, is to balance all of those interests. And that's what I think I can bring to the table, is to help, help try to get the communities of Southern Arizona um, to balance, um, balance those concerns and then effectively take them uh, to the legislature to see if we can't move on some of those. Thank you, Mr. Damien Klinko. Thank you very much. High tech, Main Street, and trade. Those are the main uh, pillars of economic development in Legislative District 2. High tech. Um, I've been meeting with uh, Representative Gabaldon and other companies throughout our district who are high-tech companies, finding out what they need from the state in order to grow and prosper and stay, because they're being approached by other, other communities and other states um, to move. And we need to be more aggressive in making sure that the really dynamic companies that are, that are being cultivated here stay here. Main Street. You know, again, we've leaving, we're leaving rural Arizona behind. Maricopa County has shown signs of coming out of the recession. Rural Arizona does not. Uh, the Main Street program is a national proven model that has worked, uh, that has worked in, over, um, in over 38 states. And we don't have it here functioning well. And so in this last cycle, I pushed for a million dollars into the budget. Um, it, um, and we'll continue to push 
uh, for that program because it is a proven program that helps get businesses and economic development going in small rural Arizona and in our, in, in our urban centers. And finally, trade. In, in all due respect to, um, to um, the opposition, our roads are in shambles. And it is actually through the advocacy of Representative Gabaldon and Senator D'Alessandro that the SR 189 is now on the 8.5 year study and is actually st undergoing study and will begin construction very uh, in, in, in the coming years. Um, so, you know, trade, trade is key. And we have this incredible partnership, but we in Phoenix can't continue to try to pass policies that is offensive to our neighbors to the south, like uh, SB 1070, um, or alienate members of our community, like SB 1062. We really need to be more inclusive and really work more closely with our partners um, on the other side of the border to make sure that we remain a dynamic trade corridor and that the trading uh, and that our agricultural businesses don't, uh, don't leave for places like Texas. Thank you. Next question, Ms. Andrea D'Alessandro. What role does the state have when it comes to immigration, protection of the border, and the recent flow of unaccompanied, unaccompanied minors? Hmm. Less, th less than what previous legis legislatures have, uh, have, have thought. Um, I just would like to let you know that I am an alumni of the uh, Border Patrol Citizens Academy in the Tucson station. I did that in 2012. I also was invited to the Customs and Border Protection Citizens Academy uh, in 2012, and I am currently in the Nogales station's Border Patrol and Citizens Academy. I strongly feel that we need to uh, for the sake of economic development, support the men and women in blue. That is the Customs and Border Protection Agency because they are the ones that they do a lot of different things. They do, they do security, but they also inspect fruit and vegetables to make sure no diseases are coming across that can contaminate our agricultural business. They uh, 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 identify counterfeit stuff that is coming in illegally. But most important is the trade that comes through, especially in the Santa Cruz, and I'm very happy to see some people from Santa Cruz County here tonight, because that is key to uh, the economic development in Santa Cruz County. So what I am suggesting, and just today on Facebook, I posted that the Customs and Border Protection was seeking more employees, and Border Patrol can um, apply for Customs and Border Protection that work at the border to facilitate the trade. In fact, the current port director, Lupe Ramirez, was in Border Patrol before he went to Customs. So I think that that's it. To make people understand the difference between the men and women in blue with Customs that facilitate trade, because 96% of the stuff that comes through our border is positive. Thank you. Mr. Daniel Estrella. As a member of the National Guard, I was in the Southwest Border Mission for the last four years. Uh, I recently finished that up in June. Um, and what I was doing was uh, initially was the boots on the ground project, where for 18 months we were there living just 100 yards away from the border, mo monitoring and making sure that there was not any um, being facilitating for the Border Patrol in order to allow them to do their jobs while we sat on places and were an opera. Uh, an observation post and a listening post. We went ahead and marked targets for them and let them know when the bad guys were coming through with drugs and human trafficking. That's what we did for, for 18 months, so I'm very versed in what they do, and I know exactly how hard these individuals work and how much we depend on them to keep our borders safe and secure. And, uh, and then after that, I went ahead for the last three years as the aviation piece of that, where the helicopters were going ahead and patrolling the, the same areas and saving lives because people are lost out there in the desert and they have no way to get out, uh, get out. And those Border Patrol agents go ahead and help them and bring them back to safety. So there's, there's, there's a lot of humanitarian issues that are, that are involved with that. So I applaud those individuals immensely because they're doing a job of both trying to be law enforcement and also being you know, paramedics, uh, EMTs, all these things all at once. And then also being burdened with the children that were coming through in the last few months. Those things are not a part of their job description when they were hired. It doesn't say that in the US, usajobs.gov uh, website. None of those things were there. But they, they still dedicate themselves uh, to that primarily on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
of course, I support them. I have, the border needs to be secure in order to, for us to go ahead and facilitate trade with Mexico and have good relationships with them. Because if we have that, then we're going to go ahead and be able to both um, reap the rewards of trade. Thank you. Mr. John Ackerley. I think there's actually three questions in there. And the first one is immigration policy, um, how people legally emigrate to, um, to the country. Um, and that, that, that is the purview of the federal government. That's not the, the purview of the state. Um, the next question is <coughs> actually the, the security, the, the stemming the illegal activity that happens um, along the border. And <coughs> I, think, I think the state has every right to be involved in that. Um, at least we need to be very supportive of um, the missions along the border that are attempting to stem um, that activity. And then there's the middle, and this is the one that always s sorts of gets everybody riled up, is, is the, okay, what about the people who are actually not involved in uh, crime, but emigrating um, despite our dysfunctional immigration policy? And there has to be a balance struck there. We have to recognize, one of my opponents already said so, we bear a disproportionate cost to our state um, because of that. So the state does have to take an active role in seeking solutions to that. There's no question about it because it directly affects all of our lives. So, <coughs> but where to find that balance point? And unfortunately, the politics as they are, I think we spend more time arguing about that than trying to find solutions to it. But we do have to recognize it as a problem and we do have to address it as a state. Thank you, Mr. Damien Klinko. Thank you. We're in desperate need of comprehensive immigration reform, and it's a federal issue. What is out of whack is when the GOP-led legislature is pushing to spend $30 million to build a virtual fence to monitor the federal government. To me, that seems like a, 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 bad, a, bad, uh, a bad use of resources when our school systems that we've talked about are failing, when we're not investing in job growth. Instead, we're spending $30 million on a virtual fence. This is coming in the next legislative cycle. And it's all the, we've been having show and tell at the legislature about this. $30 million on a virtual fence. You know, we really, as a state, need to be focused on the communities along the border. You know, they, again, have carried a disproportionate, uh, disproportionate um, impact. You know, when, when you go down to Nogales, over, almost fifth, cut by 50% are people walking across the border to spend, to spend money. You know, in, in Tubac, if you walk door to door and talk with the businesses, they've experiencing tremendous hardship because, you know, the, the permanent checkpoint has really created a deterrent for tourism. You know, we need to be focused on re-messaging our whole district about how wonderful it is. It really is, as Senator D'Alessandro said, one of the great parts of our state, its beauty, its culture, its heritage. We need to be promoting that to make sure that people come and visit and, and spend their resources and know that we're open for business, that we're really, uh, we're really a place where businesses can thrive. But if we are going to promote policies like SB 1070 that are going to divide us and create really divisive situations with our neighbors to the south, um, then we're really going to continue to experience the negative economic impact. So immigration fundamentally, it's a, it's a federal issue, but I, I am an advocate of uh, comprehensive reform. Thank you. And Ms. Rosanna Galvadon. You know, when, it, when it comes to these federal issues, it's important that we work with our congressional delegation. And uh, having conversations with these, congr these Congress members is very important because they need to know what's happening at our border. And um, when, when I go and I talk, talk to the citizens of Legislative District 2, especially Santa Cruz County, what they're saying is, is there, there need to be more, um, uh, in, as they say, employees in, in blue and not in green. Um, the thing is, is, is we, Mariposa is coming online and we really do need to focus on these, these employees, these CPB, CPB, these Custom Border Protection uh, individuals to really open up our, our border. 
also, um, you know, when it, because uh, trade and, and, and commerce is very important to the state of Arizona. So, so it, it's very important that we look at that. Now, I had a, vi I had a visit in, uh, to Yuma, and, and what I saw was, is, was agriculture and looking for employees. And one of the things, and, I, and talking to the, the farmers uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the people that are doing the cattle, and what they were talking about is, is getting the employers. So working to get these visas make, make, so that we can, we can have these employees, That's because we, I enjoy the lettuce from, from Yuma. So again, it's, uh, immig comprehensive immigration is important. It's a top priority, and and we and and I uh, want to work so that we can kind of uh, really build upon that. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, each of the candidates will have the opportunity to ask a brief question of their opponent. Prior to the debate, each candidate in the House uh, drew the name of another candidate and will have the opportunity to ask that question now. The first question is from Ms. Rosana Galvadon to Mr. John Ackerley. Mr. Ackerley, um, explain to me how you can differ from, from um, the representatives that represent Legislative District 2. What can you bring that is different than what's happening now? The biggest thing that I bring, uh, besides my experience in, um, in education to help move that forward, is I will be part of the majority party. Um, now, I say that, that I will be part of the majority party. We've heard lots of discussion about how wrong we've gone off the tracks, led by the majority party over, over the last hour. And some of it's merited, some of it's not, in my opinion. But I'm asking people to understand that because I am serving the majority in the majority party does not mean that I am serving the majority party. But what it will do is it will allow me to have access to the rooms where budgets are negotiated, be a swing vote on a committee, be able to sponsor legislation and actually see it through the legislative process. And so I'm asking folks of the district, if we can find something that we can agree on, consider me for your vote so that we can go to Phoenix and actually get something done for Southern Arizona. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Damien Klinko for Ms. Rosanna Galvadon. Uh, Representative Gabaldon, can you tell us in detail what you're doing to address infrastructure in our in legislative district too? Thank you. Um, one of the big issues that are happening <coughs> in Legislative District 2 is happening in Nogales. There is infrastructure that's bringing waste sewage from Nogales, Sonora, up to Rio Rico to the Nogales International Wastewater Treatment Facility. And one of the things that I'm doing to help with that is, um, uh, is to get funding to help uh, to, to rehabilitate the Nogales Wash. Right now, the International Boundary and Water Commission, the IBWC, is putting money towards a study to rehabilitate the IOI, which is the International Outfault Interceptor. And the thing is, if, if that IOI is, is, is repaired and we don't repair the Nogales Wash, we are going to have problems. So what I'm doing is I'm working, I'm working along with the city of Nogales, with, with the Santa Cruz County, to bring some funding so that we can address that issue. And why it's important to all of Legislative District 2 is that our water runs from the south to the north. And after that water is treated in the, in the wastewater treatment facility, it's recharged back into the Santa Cruz River. And that is the water supply that, that, we're, that we're using, uh, the, the majority of us are using. So it's important that we look and, and be able to fix and rehabilitate not only the IOI, but the Nogales Wash. And I'm working towards getting funding for that. And I'm, uh, and I'm, getting, I'm, I'm working very hard on that, and I'm, I'm moving steps forward. But again, it's very important that we do that in infrastructure. Uh, another thing is, uh, is uh, State Route 189. It's, and um, it's important that we invest in that, and I'm glad that ADOT is doing that, is recognizing that because we need to repair, we need to uh, have that, and we need to repair our roads. So infrastructure is very important. I'm learning more about it, and I can bring those, those things that I'm learning back to my legislative district. Thank you, and Mr. John Ackerley, your question for Mr. Damien Klinko. Thank you. Um, you've spent some time this evening drawing distinctions between your views and the GOP as a, as a whole. But realizing that the way legislation gets done um, is a legislative process, and that takes 
somebody in the majority um, party to actually move um, legislation. So what would be your top legislative priority um, and who on the um, Republican side of the aisle would you work with in order to get that accomplished? So in my limited time at the legislature, I've had a tremendous opportunity to build build relationships with, uh, with members of the opposite party. Um, one of the things that I've really been working on is this Main Street program, um, this economic development tool for rural and urban Arizona that's been proven to work. Um, and so I've been having meetings around the state, both with uh, members of the opposite party and stakeholders in communities all over, because this is something that would really have an impact in places like Globe and Prescott and Florence. But in our communities, it would really impact Nogales um, and Patagonia and Tubac. Um, and so that, to me, is a real priority. It's something that's actually doable, it's achievable, and it's about improving the quality of, of life of really all Arizonans and, and really improving um, our economic um, opportunities in rural, in rural communities. So I'm working with, uh, I'm working with um, having discussions with um, members of the opposite side of the aisle who are sympathetic to this type of movement. And um, as we introduce the bill, we'll, we'll have more information. Thank you. Mr. Daniel Estrella, your question for Ms. Andrea D'Alessandro. My question is to Ms. D'Alessandro is, how is it that you can measure your representation for us here in Southern Arizona if you're always voting with your party on things when the majority is still the Republicans in office? So how can it that you can have a, be effective in that? Well, first of all, your premise is not true. In the House, many bills were stopped with a bipartisan coalition. In the Senate, many bills were stopped with a bipartisan coalition. We, um, we have some members of the press here. The things that we agree on and work together on, it just doesn't make news. So you don't see the interactions we have in our offices uh, de dealing with a, a, a lot of the issues, so it, it, it just it just isn't true uh, that we we always we uh, get together in a bipartisan way. And I also uh, have a lot of respect for every member of the legislature, and I have worked diligently to find common ground. Now there might only be one thing that I agree with someone on, but believe me, I capitalize on it and develop relationships with that. And I think that that's why I'm well respected in the Senate and uh, people know that uh, I have good ideas and uh, uh, I'm, I'm reasonable to work with. Thank you. And Ms. Andrea D'Alessandro, your question for Mr. Daniel Estrella. Uh, do you belong to an organization that advocates charging Mexican nationals with their growing middle class coming to shop in Tucson, Tubac, and, and points north, a fee for coming to shop and generate millions and millions of dollars of tax revenue, sales tax revenue. So my question is, do you belong to a group that advocates charging Mexican nationals a fee? No. Thank you. Your friends are laughing because they know it's not true. <laughs> we will now begin the candidate's closing statement. The first closing statement will be given by Ms. Rosana Galvadon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it, was, um, it was an evening of uh, learning uh, about my, the, my, my uh, opponents as well as my fellow uh, legislators. Uh, you know, your vote matters. You know, on November 4th, you know, you can, you can send a message, you know, we're strong and we vote. You know, I'm looking forward to serving my second term as your Arizona State Representative. Um, I, served on the, I served on the Agriculture and, and Water Commission and the Financial Institution Commission. And so I'm, I can bring that leadership to you. Um, I, you know, I can, bring leaders, I can bring leadership, experience, and common sense. And so I'm, I'm, I ask for your, for your vote, and I hope you have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Damian Klinko, your closing comments. Thank you very much. Um, again, it's really been such an incredible honor to serve the people of Legislative District 2 um, since I was appointed. And I'm asking for your vote to continue that service. Um, I have worked tirelessly with my colleagues um, 
really f to improve and to make sure that legislative district two is a priority at the state capitol. Um, what you'll get from me is somebody who listens, someone who's thoughtful, and um, someone who will really take your concerns into, into account in trying to find solutions that impact us all. Um, and so I really hope um, you'll consider voting for me on November 4th, and I really um, appreciate your time. Thank you. Mr. John Ackerley. Thank you. Thank you so much for the Clean Elections Commission for hosting the debate, and thank you again, guys, for coming out um, and joining us this evening. Um, I'm not running for the State House of Representatives because I am a Republican. Um, I'm a physics teacher, and so the way I evaluate everything is the same way I approach solving physics problems. It's part of who I am. It's all based on fundamental principles. So I have core beliefs of limited government, local control, and fiscal responsibility. And it's because those core beliefs that I happen to fall more in line with the Republican Party than the Democratic Party. I'm running to help fix education in this state and represent Southern Arizona. So I'm asking the folks of District 2, if we can agree on something, help me get to the legislature so we can start working together to get those things done. Thank you again for coming out, and I would truly appreciate your vote in November. Thank you, Mr. Daniel Estrella. Thank you again for um, the Clinton Action Commission for holding this forum here, and also for all of you coming out here. I really appreciate that. I'll see you know a lot of my supporters out here. Thank you very much for coming and braving the elements. Um, have a safe trip back to your back to your homes, please. Um, the reason why I'm running is is to prove that you don't have to be retired, you don't have to be rich, you don't have to come from a family name. I'm here to show everyone that you can go ahead, if you believe something strong enough, that you can go ahead and affect change. And you don't have to, you can go ahead and be a voice for the people. You can go ahead and show that my, I can show my children, I can show the kids that go to school, I can show the kids that, that grew up like I did with a single mom that had to go ahead and work two jobs and then I had to go ahead and assist and work with her also in nighttime. I went ahead and did all of those things, and I'm here despite all of those things. I wasn't given things. I wasn't privileged, or I wasn't coming from a place where, where it was not possible. I never thought I would be here, and that's the, that's the greatness of America, and that's the greatness of what we do here. I've dedicated my life to serving this nation and serving the, the state of Arizona in the military, and this is just another form of service for me. I want to go ahead and utilize all my talents and skills in order to go ahead and represent you here in southern Arizona. You know, I've, I've been to war, and you trusted me with your sons and daughters then. I think you can go ahead and trust me with your vote this time. Thank you. Ms. Andrea D'Alessandro? Well, first of all, again, I'd like to thank Ch uh, Clean Elections for changing the venue. I think uh, the crowd is a little larger than it would have been at the other lo uh, uh, location. And, you know, I'm a first-generation college student, and I'm half first-generation high school graduate. My mother, during the Depression, had to drop out of school and went to work in a factory when she, when she was uh, 14 years old. So I, as I mentioned, as I started out, I've gotten to uh, live the American dream through a lot of, a lot of hard work and uh, with affordable, affordable higher education. Just like to let you know that both uh, myself and my seats mates, Representative uh, Ga Rosanna Gabaldon and Demi Inclinko, have been endorsed by the Arizona Technology Council, the Arizona Nurses Association, the professional firefighters, and teachers, and many other professional organizations. And I am a full-time legislator. I do this every day. If I, I, I did leave the state for a week to, that allowed me last Christmas to take time to read a book because I work at this full time every day. Yesterday I was in a TUSD school at Bort, Borton Elementary Magnet School at 8.30 in the morning for a tour. I'm also professional, not only uh, professional in the sense that I've been an educator and, and a certified public accountant, but I'm also a professional in dealing with people. I give excellent constituent services, and I have the ability to work across the aisle. And I want to thank everyone who's here who gave me $5 contribution, because with your help, 
I was able to become the first candidate in the state to qualify for clean elections, and I received, my check was dated April 9th, and I received my money on April 10th, which would have been my mother's birthday. So I dedicate this campaign to her. Thank you. We thank you so much for participating in our forum, and we thank all of you who took the time to come and inform yourselves before voting. We encourage you to find out more about clean elections and the candidates running for office by visiting www.azcleanelections.gov. A link to the video of this debate, as well as other clean elections debates, will be posted on that site within 72 hours of a scheduled debate. We also ask that you fill out the debate evaluation form you received as you entered and return it to one of our volunteers. Your feedback is important to the commission. Again, thank you all for coming tonight.